So in this episode, we're going to try to make this always on, but lasting possibly several weeks on one battery charge weather center, giving you the local immediate forecast, uh, the next 12 hour forecast, the next four day forecast, and some local information about your immediate environment too. Let's get cracking. Is that it? <sighs> So let's talk about some preliminaries of this setup. You can see I've got it all wired up here already. We'll talk about how I did this later on in the video. You can get a full weather forecast for the next, uh, I think it's the next three hours or so on there, with the date and time that, that weather forecast was taken at. And you've got the next, well that's the next three o'clock one from there, then six o'clock, nine o'clock and midnight. So you've got in three hour slots, the upcoming next 12 hours or so forecast there. You've got humidity and pressure for this area, your wind and direction of wind, uh, the average temperature, the low it should get to and the height it might be, with a, very, with a brief description of the fact of what your weather will be at this very moment in time, or at 10 to two in my case. Very overcast with clouds. We also get a forecast for the next four days, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday with appropriate icons that go there. So it's basically saying heavy dark cloud, uh, just lighter cloud and heavy dark cloud, again, etc. We'll come up with rain, rain, thunder, lightning, snow icons, all them I've done for you. And if the sensor was connected up here, we'd have your local pressure, temperature, humidity data there as well. All not soldered. So you just all wired together, all connected. You can shove it into a project box along with your battery and you've got a working project, no soldering iron required. And it should last for some time on a battery. For me, this has been lasting around two weeks and this was a really cheap one. I have a really cheap charger for a pound. You can get yourself a much better quality one, which I have much more capacity than this one does. Or in fact, get yourself a bigger battery bank and that will last significantly longer too. I'm hoping if you can put something in the comments that some of these might last several weeks depending on what, how much capacity of battery you've got. Leave a comment below if you've had yours last for longer than mine, which I think the last, longest mine lasted was two weeks. So to make this project, you will need a project box. This is fairly oversized, but I plan on adding a big screen later. You will need a screen an e-paper display. You will need an ESP32. This is a specific one, you need this specific one. This is a TTGO Lilygo ESP32. Chosen because this has an extremely low power consumption when in deep sleep mode. That is essential to be able to make this project run batteries for uh, hopefully depending on your battery size, for many weeks. You will need a 18650 lithium battery, uh, battery holder, or some other sort of battery pack, maybe, because with this one, with, the, with this type of battery and battery pack, we connect via a little block connector to the onboard connector of this. This will mean the battery will last longer. You can plug and use this from this connector too, so you could use one of these style of power banks and just connect it in there and that would actually work it and operate it fine but they won't necessarily last as long obviously depending on the battery capacity but there's some circuitry in these which will take up some juice when it's in deep sleep mode you will also need a bme 280 sensor this measures pressure humidity and temperature all in one really convenient neat little package and you will not need a soldering iron no soldering required so the next job for me was to mark out the screen where i wanted to go on my project box choose the correct bit for my router you could use some other method of cutting out cut out the required rectangle for my screen Drill the mounting holes to actually fix the screen to the box. And then because my bolts weren't long enough 
and then have to add some hot glue to keep my screen in position. Don't! Wasn't totally happy where the screen doesn't centralise with the bolts, but that's just the property of this screen. Irritating, but what can you do? So let's have a look at the connections you need to make from this screen to the ESP32. The busy goes to pin 4, RST, or the reset pin, pin 16, the DC to pin 17, the CS to pin 5, the clock to pin 18, the DIN to pin 23, that's basically the MOSI, or MOSI, however you pronounce it, the SBI connection, VCC to 3.3 volts, and the ground to ground. So let's see what software drivers you'll have to install into your Arduino IDE in order to drive this e-paper display. So I'll go to sketch, include library, manage library, and type in e-paper. And the one I'm recommended, you'll see, you'll see a few on here, but the one I'm recommending is the one you can see that I've got installed here. I have tried more than one. This was the one that I was most happy with. So I'll scroll this to the top so you can see which one it is I'm doing. It's the GX EPD2 by Jean-Marc Zing. Hopefully pronounced approximately correctly. And obviously install the latest one, which I have 1.2 installed, which will be, I am guessing, yep, the latest one that's slightly older. And one of the reasons I like this, I mean, apart from the fact that it worked better than the others in some other ways, is that it works with the Adafruit graphics library. And I'm quite familiar with that. I've used it over a lot of the displays I've used. So install that. And if you've never used the Adafruit graphics library, then you will need to install that as well. So you need to install, type in, Adafruit GFX. And it's this one here. Install that and you should be good to go. So to connect up your BME280 sensor, shown here, the 3 volt 3 bottom connection here, VCC connection basically, goes to pin 27 of this board. The ground goes to any ground on this board. You can see you just connect them all at the back. The SCL, third pin up from the bottom here, as you see it here, goes to pin 22. And the SDA goes to pin 21. Do all that correctly, power it up, then we should see a display at the bottom here. It says this room, temperature 23 degrees, humidity 51% and the pressure 1020. Okay, so you're going to need a library to talk to this chip, so I'll go up to tools, manage libraries and go into the filter box and type in Adafruit BME280. And that's the library you want. You should presumably probably only get one like I have. I've already got it installed. You just click install there and away you go. So in order to get your ESP32 to access the internet and get the weather data down to actually give you a forecast, there's a few things you need to do. If you look here, on your Wi-Fi network, you will have an SSID. You need to put your SSID for your network, for your Wi-Fi network, in this string here. You also need to put your Wi-Fi password for your Wi-Fi network in this string here as well. So that will be then allow the ESP32 to connect to your internet, to your network, and then we need to access the weather forecast. So we do that using a website called openweathermap.org. And you can see I've got a couple of URLs here, internet addresses here for, a, for the website. What you need to do is Within this string here, you can see what we're doing. This is the actual short term weather forecast string here. And all you need to do, where it says app ID here, well, before we do app ID actually, where it says your town here, you need to put your town, wherever you live, your village, wherever it might be. Uh, I think it accepts postcodes and zip codes as well in there. And also your country of origin. So for me, I'm UK. You would need to put in there, USA or Australia or whatever and then also your finite location, your exact location, your time, etc. Once you've got those in, you then need an application ID, an app ID for the openweathermap.org website. And to get an app ID, so you're going to get your app ID, you're going to put it in there 
You're also going to put it in there as well, as long as with a repeat of your town and country location there. To get an app ID from openweathermap.org, you need to sign up for it. So bring up the website here. So if you go to openweathermap.org there, you can see the, web, the actual web address there. And click on sign up up here. Fill in your details here. So you need to create yourself a username and your password. As you can see, I've created it for the external account. You would then put your password in. So it's pre-filled that in because I've already signed up on this, obviously, already. You fill in your own details in there. Don't put in Extronic or etc. because that username will be taken. That'd be rather silly. Click on the required checkboxes down on these bits here. Obviously, I'm not a robot bit. And create yourself an account by clicking there. When you've created your account, I can't remember for sure, but I think the next page will give you your actual openweathermap.org ID. So really quite long string of about 32 numbers and letter characters all together. Remember about that. It's quite a long one. You'll get that. Then all you need to do once you've got that ID is to paste it into that location there and to that location there. And along with your time done there and there and your country there and there. And of course your Wi-Fi, SSID and password. Your ESP32 should be able to access the internet, pull down the weather data and populate and fill out your screen. It is important to note that this is free. It costs you nothing to use the openweathermap.org data. But with that freeness of it, you can only access it up to a maximum of 60 times per minute. So you can only call that website up to 60 times per minute for your particular application ID. If you call it more than that, they're going to probably block the account Send you an email saying, I think you should upgrade and use the paid version, which allows you to have many more calls per minute. You may ask yourself, well, who's going to, you know, up, call the website more than 60 times per minute, particularly when they only update, update their data a maximum of once every 20 minutes or so. It's updated. Well, the reason you might want to do that is you might, you might build several of these modules with your application ID. So imagine if you built 30 of these modules, giving them back to friends, families, selling them for a massive increase on the internet or whatever, using your same application ID, if they're all switched on at once, 30 of them call in three times an hour, that's 90 times an hour. So you're already going over there. So that's when, if you were using this commercially, that you'd want to probably purchase an application ID that allowed you to access it more than once. But for our purposes, just building yourself one or two, maybe one or two for friends and family, it'll be fine. You may also want to actually Reduce it, if we come down here, we'll look at time to sleep, and it says the time the ESP will go to sleep in minutes. So it goes to sleep for 20 minutes at a time. So that means I'll call that weather forecast three times an hour. If you want to only call it one time an hour, which will extend your battery life massively as well, actually. It roughly, if I call it once an hour rather than three times an hour, would roughly make the battery last three times longer. It's not exactly that, but it's fairly near. So if I change that to 60 there, that would actually just call it once per hour. Maybe you want to do it twice per hour, 30. For my purposes at the moment, I'm going to leave it at 20. So that's it. Get them IDs in, compile and upload that, and you should have the display we showed earlier. So your power options are, as it's shown here, with a direct battery connection. You actually have a small on-off switch on here as well for that, if you wished. Turn it on and off. And it goes via that special connector there. Or you can just power it from here. Advantages of that is that this can be taken out and recharged relatively easily. You don't have to buy an extra charger for that because most people have one of these type of chargers everywhere these days. You can't move for USB charges in your home from the time you get a new phone or whatever it might be. This advantage, the extra circuitry in these to allow them to charge and discharge, actually we use up some of the energy of this so it won't last quite as long but you could get conveniently quite a big power bank that would fit in to one of your box of your choice so up to you swings and roundabouts slightly easier to manage perhaps but might not last as long depending on your battery size you get with this will probably last quite a while you can get bigger capacity batteries as well make sure it's always outputting 3.7 volts whatever battery cell you're getting but of course you'd need an extra charger. 
So improvements you could make would be to remove this LED here, so you don't even use any energy up with that. To have a bigger power bank of some description, might need to change your box size, so it actually would last for longer. Have less weather updates. It's set at currently three per hour every 20 minutes. If you set it for one per hour, one per hour, then approximately the batteries would last roughly three times as long, almost, because it takes so little when it's in sleep mode compared to it's actually accessing the internet. Also, a bigger screen, that's certainly the update that I plan to do. So I want one roughly that will fill up ish to there, but they are expensive, so cost is an issue. So that upgrade will come when funds permit it. I will also make sure I don't have these screws on the front and that it's mounted and fixed somehow, even if it's just hot glue internally on there like that, because I don't think that looks particularly nice. And just a point of note, I'm not sure how clear it is on the camera. I seem to have got some damage to my paper display here. You can see there's some stripe lines. I hope you can see there's some stripe lines going down there. Very faint, almost grey. And a little patch here as well. That would suggest that somewhere I've put some stress on the actual display module. Or maybe the heat from the glue, perhaps at this, set, this end, just near the actual display, has caused an issue. So just be careful and be wary of that. So let's... Bung it all together, shove it in the box, and assemble it to see what it looks like. So that's it. All finished, a fully working, no soldering required project. All the parts that you've seen here are listed in the description below as affiliate links. So you can click on those if you want any of these, and that'll give me a little sweet kickback, but with no extra cost to yourselves. Thanks very much to my patrons who support me on Patreon, and of course, Thank you very much for watching.